Uh, let's start our topic, our session today, health technology assessment and value-based healthcare in Asia-Pacific. This session will be moderated by Kun Paul Mendoza, IAPO board member, WPRO region. And our speakers are Kun Gan Chanok Siri Son, Project Associate, Health Intervention and Technology Assessment, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. The second, Dr. Thomas Kelly, CEO, Sprink. You can find their full biographies on the Fourth Asia Pacific Patients Congress page on IAPO's website. And before we get started, we invite you to submit questions to the speakers, whether you are attending in person or online. Online attendees, please send your question via the Q&A tab by the virtual stage. Now, I invite our moderator, Kun Paul Mendoza, to take the floor. All right, G good morning, everyone. So we are starting our session for health technology assessment and value-based healthcare in the Asia Pacific. So just to give you an overview what we are gonna talk about today, this session looks at access to innovative medicines through patient engagement and advocacy activity in health technology assessment and value-based healthcare approaches. So health is a political choice and UHC 2030 investment choices are being made within a complex post-COVID competing ecosystem. How will innovative evidence-based medicines, services, health devices, and other health technologies be procured to ensure that countries can extend their UHC to cover most of their population, giving them more appropriate and effective healthcare services and medicines, and reducing their out-of-pocket contributions. And hopefully, how do you then decide what is reimbursed? And hopefully in this session, we will see what are the things that they should look at, the government should look at, and as patient organizations, what can we bring on the table and on the discussion for this HTA process? So let me invite our first speaker for this session. So she is Kanchanak Sirison, Project Associate of the Health Intervention and Technology Assessment Program, or HITAP, from the Ministry of Public of Health of Thailand. So, welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from a uh, health intervention technology assessment in Thailand, which we call HITAP, and we just located in the Ministry of Public Health. So uh, I believe that some of you here are from uh, the patient groups or patient organization within Thailand or other countries. I uh, have believed that also we have worked before uh, because we work with a lot of patient organization. Or if we have not worked with you, please reach out to me and perhaps we can uh, collaborate and work together in the future. So the topic that I'm going to be talking today is the development and the role of HTA and the patient engagement in Thailand. Um, as many speakers have mentioned, um, HTA is really a critical tool for patients to really speak and communicate with policymakers. And I would like to give an example of the experience and the process that happening in Thailand. So uh, we would like to start from what is HTA uh, and then go on to the development of HTA in Thailand, the patient engagement in HTA process and the role of HTA agency like HITAP to um, contributing the patient engagement in Thailand and what are the lessons learned or future directions for the future of patient engagement in HTA. So let's start with the concepts. Um, Anyone knows what HTA means in, in your language or in your terms? So uh, technically speaking, as it's already shown on the slides, 
Um, HTA is a multidisciplinary process that uses explicit methods to determine the values of health technologies at different points in its life cycle. It may sound really scientific, but basically the purpose is to inform decision making. And, and for that, it in, it's helped to promote uh, an equitable, efficient, and high-quality health system. And with this HTA, it has been used as a tool to bridging the gaps um, to uh, when you would like to propose any new technologies or new interventions, you would need this high-quality evidence to show to the policymaker um, to provide this good value of money, and with that, it helped with the decision-making process. And for the journey from uh, the technologies to become a policy, it will need a good qualities of evidence to be able to show the safety of the technologies or medication, vaccine, intervention, anything that you named off. And then it will be, be able to show efficacy, you know, effectiveness, and all of those evidence to be gathered uh, for the decision making. And we also have to take into account of the feasibilities, you know, whether your local hospital have a certain machine or um, uh, some doctors that are specialized in degree that they be able to de deliver those medicines or, or interventions. And with that, it has to take into account of the ethical, legal, and social implications of those uh, interventions as well, and be able to provide a priority settings um, decision making for the policymakers. So, for that, in Thailand, um, HTA can help to promote um, the implication. On, on four stream, I would like to mention first here is the pharmaceutical products uh, and then vaccine products and non-pharmaceutical or non-vaccine products and public policy evaluation. And with that, we have the specific name, uh, the National List of Essential Medicine or in LALIEM, uh, in Thai is called Banshia Lakheng Chat. And the other one for vaccine is the National List of Essential Vaccine or in LALIEM. Banchi um, vaccine hang chart. And the last but not least is the benefits package under the uh, Universal Coverage Scheme, UCBP, Choose City Payut. And these are the important uh, government structures that sit in the Thai system. How the HTA can help support um, through these two streams. So let me give an example of the UCBP on the left hand side of the screen. You will see that. Various stakeholders, including patients and professionals, uh, healthcare professionals, including HTA agency, can work together to provide evidence through the working groups. And when they evaluate this evidence, then they will make a recommendation to the board, which is uh, the funder, or uh, in this case is National Health Security so uh, Office, which is SOPO um, Social, to uh, make a recommendation and include that within the national list of essential medicines or vaccines. Uh, general speaking, HTA process include roughly six steps. The first one is topic nomination. You, when you want particular drugs or vaccine to be included within the package or the benefit package or reimbursement package, you have to nominate the topics, and then it will get selected through various criteria, and then the subcommittees or the working group will then uh, assign uh, HDA agency or research team to conduct studies. And after the results has come out, they have to appraise for quality evidence and make a decision, make a recommendation to be included within the Thai Royal Gazette. And with that, after the implementation, we need strong m and framework or impact evaluation framework to help all of this cycle would then happen all together. So let's give an example of the benefits package. Um, so how patient can involve in this process is that at the really first step, when there's topic nomination process, patients can uh, gather evidence 
and nominate the topics, and that can be uh, assessed and evaluated through these various steps. Um, I give example of the criteria here um, for your information, but we're just going to skip through that now. Um, how to ensure that the study are high quality? So we have the guideline. In Thailand, we have this HTA process guideline to uh, uh, make sure or ensure that all researchers are up to these standards. And the way, really important step is in the step four, where the stakeholders uh, meeting consultation are being organized to gather information, feedback from the patients. So the current situation in Thailand, uh, patients are directly and indirectly involving in only some part of the HTA process, and we would like to encourage more. Um, to go into detail, as I was mentioned before, the topic nomination usually involves various stakeholders, and patients or the civic groups can help to gather information and be part of this process to nominate the topics. Um, in, and these are actually example, a good example of the public hearing channels to collect the feedback from the patient. And in Thailand, we have these uh, websites for patients to, to, to go on this website and then you know, give you some feedback and nominate any topic that you would like to get. Uh, for example, if you are uh, having um, one particular diseases and, and you know you speak to other uh, peer patients from other countries and they have wonderful and new promising medicines that are not available in the reimbursement list of Thailand, you would like to get that. You like to include that in the list of Thailand. How would you do? You gather those evidence and then you nominate this through these channels. So that's just an example. And the next step, how the patient can involve in this process is to, through the research studies uh, at HITAP or other research agency, when we conduct the studies, we invite uh, various stakeholders to be part of the meetings, to, uh, to share the feedback, to uh, give the patient perspective on um, uh, especially like the adherence or um, social implication, uh, vaccine hesitancies and other things. And those are important because we would never get those information or data if it's not without patients. Um, we would usually send a survey or questionnaire to us uh, about the health-related quality of life. Um, in technical term, we have this Euroco uh, EQ5D5L for utilities. And those are information that we need from patients directly to be included within the studies. Um, as a research agency, we then conduct the studies. So some of the study could be the economic evaluation, feasibility analysis, uh, review lab, uh, rapid review or other budget impact analysis. And those will create an evidence like efficacy, feasibility, budget impact, where the policymaker will be used uh, for their recommendation. And the last step of the HPA process that patient can involve directly is through the implementation and impact evaluation. Because uh, once the medication is available or intervention is available, uh, we would like to know how is it you know, being implemented in real life? How, how is it, uh, what's the impact of those implementation? And that's where patient can take part in into the survey, into the study, and, and gather those information uh, at HITAP, we produce some um, uh, policy brief, which is the more easy, friendly, digested um, information where you can read about your new medication that's available in the benefit package, for example. And these are the examples on the screen. So when we come to lessons um, within Thailand, I think this is just some of the lessons learned through our uh, collaboration or our study with patient engagement in HTA, we realized that there's a limited patient network in Thailand. Um, uh, I, I was listening earlier to Niti about the, the Singaporean patient network, and I think, yeah, we need that. We need that strong 
and a big wide patient network, uh, we also have a situation where we lack of HTA awareness. A uh, patient usually don't understand what is HTA, how HTA can help them to uh, generate the evidence and be able to communicate with policymakers. And we, we need that HTA awareness among patient groups. And what we don't have is also a systemic report or data collections uh, mechanism in Thailand. For example, it could be like the, uh, the patient report outcome, patient reported outcome measures, or the real world evidence that we need to gather. And, and actually, COVID-19 has m made us realize how important of that as well, because at a certain time, we, we need the good, strong data system to be able to provide uh, information in a timely manner. And we also realize that society has personal interests for uh, their own benefit and not um, totally for the research. Uh, if, from our experience, it's kind of difficult sometimes when we engage with patient groups because obviously in Thailand, we haven't had that patient alliance that we can connect directly. Uh, lots of time, it gets uh, lost in the middle of communication because of that as well. And we also realize that uh, the research input mainly comes from clinicians, and it doesn't really directly represent patient views and patient voice itself. So with that, how do we do to make our uh, patient communities and the interaction between HD agency and patient engagement in Thailand become stronger? Uh, first of all, we have to think big. Uh, we, we have to think that we can do and we can create this strong network together based on these opportunities and, and opportunities like this, like this uh, Congress platform that patient can connect, patient can create uh, the network among themselves. And, and with that, we have to cultivate the strong patient network um, to be able to sustain um, this engagement with HTA. And at HITAP, we provide lots of HTA training, EE trainings, and, and there's lots of opportunities through webinars where patients can engage in those as well. So please reach out and, and really be actively engaged in those activities. And we have to move systemically. And with that, the government, the structures, system, and people have to work and move together. And the last but not least, we do recognize that building capacity is, doesn't happen in one day. It will need a lot of effort uh, to build the long-term technical uh, capacity among patient groups. So um, with that, uh, if you have any questions or would like to reach out, please do. And thank you for having me today. Thank you. So thank you, Kanchanok Si Rison, for sharing the HTA process here in Thailand. And uh, uh, we need to understand also that here in the Asia Pacific, HTA is something new. Although we do have other countries that are advanced, like Taiwan is very good in HTA and patient engagements. And when it comes to data gathering, Korea, South Korea is very good. but here uh, that's number one challenge for the patients right because first we need data and some of the countries they have no researches available uh, or researches done locally so those are some of the challenges and i hope later in our q a we can further discuss how patient organizations can give meaningful inputs in the table in the discussion for hda and right now, uh, we'll be, let me introduce our second speaker for this session. So we've learned about health technology assessment, and now we will learn about value-based healthcare. So how does this play a role or can help in improving the healthcare for patients? So let me introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Thomas Kelly, the CEO of Spring. Welcome.
Um, okay, well, good, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here uh, today. I'm just going to start by uh, why I'm interested in all of this. So I, um, I'm a, a physician by uh, training and profession, um, and in 2010, uh, when I graduated from medical school in the UK, um, I was quite struck uh, when I started working as a junior hospital doctor that quality of care varied enormously on the same ward. Um, we didn't really ask people, what do you want? It was make a diagnosis and then commence treatment following a set pathway. Um, and experience was also highly variable uh, with some terrible experiences that we would witness and very little would be done about any of this. It would be known, but we wouldn't discuss it. We didn't really have too much in the way of quality um, review, certainly not around outcomes. And experience, bad experience, would often go, uh, would be brushed under the carpet. Now, at that time, Michael Porter uh, published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about the idea of value, which I'll come on to in a moment. And it very much resonated with me as something that could help address some of the challenges that I was seeing from a, uh, a hospital doctor's perspective. Um, I, I then moved to Boston after that to work to help set up this organization called ICHOM, the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement, uh, which focused on how do we measure outcomes that matter to people. Um, and that gained quite a bit of, of traction in different parts of the world. Uh, and then I worked for the Welsh Government in the UK for uh, a period of time figuring out how we do this across a, you know, a reasonably small country there in Wales with about three and a half million people. Now, in terms of context about what we're going to discuss today, I, I did some Googling of some prominent hospitals that many of you, I imagine all of you, have, have heard of. So the first is my home system, the, the NHS. Now, when you look at the NHS website, what does it say about the values that underpin what the NHS does? This, this is what you see. So it says patients come first in everything that we do. We value every person and we aim to improve uh, lives. If in this broader region of the world, if you go to the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia, what do they say? Very easy to find it. It says we're committed to working with you, our patients and carers, they, they add, and wider community to, infer, to further improve your experience and your outcomes. We've heard about Sing Health already today, but very prominently on their website, patients at the heart of all that we do. Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, guided by the needs of our patients, Mass General delivers care grounded in leading uh, edge research, advanced treatment offerings, offerings, and the latest clinical trials. And then if you look at the European Industry Association, FPA, the European Federation of uh, Pharmaceutical Industry Association, so the representative body for the biopharmaceutical industry, and pretty much what you see across all of their representative members from the, the, the massive companies like Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson uh, through to the much smaller companies, it's all about improving the lives of individual people. Now, interestingly, I spent about an hour looking at different hospitals in Thailand, and I couldn't find a vision statement, a mission statement uh, that focused on the individual. And I could be wrong with that, but it was, I couldn't find it. But listening to what you've just said is, is reassuring, of course, from the HTA perspective. So, this is what hospitals and healthcare systems are saying they want to do. Now, when we look at measurement, that measurement, of course, is a tool that can help us determine whether we're achieving what it is that we want to achieve. I think in healthcare we have to be very careful that we don't get too um, uh, uh, focused on measurement because, of course, it's part of what we need to do, but it's not going to solve everything. So when we think about measurement uh, and measuring towards what the stated goals are of these healthcare systems, what have we seen? How has that evolved? Now, if you go back about 50 years to, so to the 1960s and 1970s, this idea of evidence-based medicine came to the, to the fore. 
Um, and that was all about partly what you've just heard about health technology assessment. It was all about looking at effectiveness. If we're going to do something, whether that's using a medicine, whether it's buying and using a technology, whether it's developing and implementing a new service, we need to know, is it effective? And that's quite often being defined in clinical trial and endpoints. That might be a biomarker, it might be a hard outcome like survival or, or something else. But that quickly led to cost effectiveness. We, it became clear it's, there's no point having something that's effective if it's so expensive that it's, it's completely unsustainable. And what that led to as we went forwards over the 80s and 90s is a whole raft of things around measurement. So we had the development of standards and guidelines. Um, uh, and in line with that, measurement audits. Are we meeting the standards? Are we meeting the steps that are dictated by the standards? If you have uh, a certain type of heart attack, from the point at which the chest pain begins, do you get a stent in your artery within two hours of the onset of chest pain? Yes or no? That's what the evidence says we should do. That's the quality standard. We measure whether that's done or not. Payment incentives started to come into place, incentivizing hospitals for meeting certain quality standards. And what we've also heard today, the focus on patient safety, a recognition that yes, we might be uh, meeting and aspiring to meet certain quality standards, but that doesn't mean we're practicing healthcare safely. So that's where we got to by about the year 2000. And what then, became a realization was that, well, we can be meeting all of these standards, we can be doing all of this measurement, and we can have the belief that we're doing everything well. But does that actually mean that we're meeting the outcomes that matter to people? And the answer is no, it doesn't. We can be applying all of the evidence but that, uh, and doing that very well, but the person that sat in front of us it does not mean that we're achieving the outcomes that matter to them. Let me just give you uh, an example, actually, uh, after this slide. But this is what Michael Porter and Elizabeth Teisberg um, developed. So in 2006 was their book, 2010 was a, an article they wrote. So the framework you see with the yellow circles, but the essence of this view, their view was that we have to systematically measure the outcomes that matter to people around diseases for everybody, and we have to do the same with cost, with the aim being that we achieve the outcomes that matter to people at the lowest possible cost. That, that's what they said. And you can hopefully see how that builds on uh, everything that I've just said about quality compliance. Now, these graphs just help to illustrate why this is important. So this is data for people with prostate cancer. And you see Germany, where the German flag is, Sweden, where the Swedish flag is, and a hospital in Germany uh, called the Martini Clinic, which uh, is part of the uh, Hamburg University Hospital. And what repeated studies have shown is that for people with prostate cancer, often survival is important. Incontinence is a big problem, uh, when you, particularly when you have an operation. And of course, most people don't want to be incontinence. And erectile dysfunction is also important. Most people don't want to have erectile dysfunction. So what do you see? These, these are hospitals meeting all of the quality standards, doing everything that the evidence says that they should be doing. But what do we see with the outcomes? Well, survival actually is pretty much the, you know, it's pretty much the same across Germany, Sweden, and the Martini Clinic. But when you get into some of these broader outcomes that we don't often measure actually, you see massive variation. Um, if you look at the average in Germany, 43%, the average in Sweden, 50%, so 50% of people who have an operation to remove their prostate for prostate cancer are incontinent after the operation. I mean, that's an enormous number of people. Uh, but 6.5% at the Martini Clinic. So what is this message? It's only one example, of course, but just to help illustrate the point. There are two messages here. One, we can measure compliance with quality standards, but it does not mean that we're going to get 
the same outcomes. Because, of course, healthcare is complicated and how you apply the evidence varies massively, even if you're meeting the standard. And what it also shows is that if we have a blind focus uh, on survival in this case, but we don't have a broader holistic view about what matters to all of us as human beings with different con uh, conditions, we miss huge variation in quality. But I think what we have to then ask ourselves is if value-based healthcare is helping us to focus on the outcomes that matter to us all, as I say, with our different conditions, is it really supporting us to focus on the individual? And I would say it's probably not, actually. It's a step in that direction, but it doesn't go far enough. Now, some of you may have heard of Don Berwick, who uh, set up and ran for many years the, uh, the IHI, um, based in, in Boston in, in, the, in the US. And he said this, that patient-centered healthcare is the experience of transparency, individualization, recognition, respect, dignity, and choice in all matters, without exception, related to one's person, circumstances, and relationships in healthcare. And that has come on somewhat, I think, it's fair to say, to treating us as people, as human beings. And I'll just focus on the second paragraph there, which is that where we, it's, it's a focus on really people leading meaningful lives rather than just functional lives. And so I just wanted to give you an example. So in a colorectal cl cancer clinic a couple of months ago, this is someone who came. Who came. It was a 90-year-old man who had bowel cancer, um, but the surgeon said to this, this man, it's okay, I can do the operation. It hasn't spread beyond the wall of the large intestine, and we can cure this for you. However, it will be a big operation. It is most likely going to require intensive care after the operation, and you might need a colostomy bag, a bag in the, down here to take the, the stools for the rest of your life. But I think we'll get you back to what you're doing now, but I don't know how long it's going to take. What would you do if that was you? So the measurement system tells us five-year survival is important. It tells us quality of life is important. That's what's being measured in this health system. And we have all of these quality standards around how to do the operation. So the, the, what the surgeon wanted to do here was to operate. That was the push. That was what was, he was trained to do. And it was also what the system was pushing him to do. But this person said, I don't want an operation. If I'm not alive in two months, that's OK for me. If I'm still alive in two years, that's also OK for me. What I want, I don't want to be in intensive care. I don't want a big operation. I don't want to be in pain. And I want to spend time with my grandchildren. They're my priorities. That's what I want to do. But the measurement system and, and how we measure quality and accountability doesn't capture that. And so, and so how do we bring these things together? Because we need measurement, we need accountability, we need to know how we're doing, but we need to reflect what matters to each of us as individual people, otherwise we don't create value, we potentially destroy value. And of course, in the whole of this, we have to remember health equity. We all have finite resources, all health systems. How are we going to allocate those equitably to different groups, however we define them, demographically, socially, economically, or geographically. So this is what we believe we need to do. Uh, and this, this actually was a, a, a very large piece of work that Caldip was part of uh, over a couple of years. We don't need to invent anything new here, but we do need to bring these things closer together. That value-based healthcare has a lot to offer with structured standardized measurement, person-centered healthcare, of course, with its focus on the individual, and health equity with uh, its focus on the equitable allocation of resource. Uh, they work in parallel at the moment. They need to come together. So what does that mean uh, in, a, in a nutshell? If you think of a health system as split uh, into three levels, there's the interaction that happens between individual people and individual healthcare professionals. That's the micro level. There's the meso level, which is the service, where you're 
going to seek help, the pathway of care, the service that's delivering it. And then there's the macro level, which is the population that's being, uh, the overall population that's being uh, served. So what I would encourage that we need to, to, to do is at that micro level, we need to systematically, through shared decision making, understand the goals, the values, and the preferences of individual people at that particular point in their life, and that needs to be linked up to the standardized measurement we have. So the standardized measurement needs the context of the person. Otherwise, it's impossible for us to know whether it's good or not. Take the five year survival example again. That's what we all focus on for cancer uh, success criteria. And that is a massive oversimplification because if we don't understand what matters to a person at a particular point in their lives, five year survival that's high may be a good outcome for some, it may be a bad outcome for others. So we have to have the context in, in our view through goals and preferences. At the meso level, so the service level, the, the, the pathway level, that standardized data, which has the context, which understands the individual, we can now use to, to learn and improve. And we also need, which is a bit of what we've discussed al already, user-centered design so that the services we're developing reflect the variation of the communities that we're serving. And then finally, at the macro level, this is where we have to allocate our resource. We need to be transparent about how we do that. It should be informed by aggregated value data, and it should reflect the goals and preferences of, uh, of individuals. I'm going to just end with a few perspectives on what that means for the different groups that work in healthcare. I think for patients, for people receiving care, it's vital to have the option, at least, to set and to define and to express goals and preferences, and to work with healthcare teams equally to figure out how to achieve those within the envelope of resources that have been provided. Healthcare systems then have to put goals and preferences at the center of everything they do. This isn't about saying we can provide everything to everybody all of the time. It's about understanding what people want and need and then trying as hard as we can to use the resources we've got to meet uh, those goals and preferences. For life science companies, it's equally important. For the medicines and technologies that they develop through the approaches that um, you've already heard, but they need to partner with healthcare systems to ensure that those medicines and technologies are optimally utilized, that they're used in the right people, aligned to their goals and preferences. Uh, and then finally, payers and government. I think we have to be very careful about paying for outcomes. But what I do think we can do is that payers can help to incentivize this move to goals and preferences and standardized measurement uh, through, um, through their payment structures. And I think governments need to be very clear uh, that the only way that we can go forwards is through a focus on the individual in the context of limited resources across our systems. And that requires national policies and structured education from the undergraduate through to the executive uh, in order to make that happen. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that um, overview of value-based care. And uh, it's very interesting to hear the concept that it's not just the doctors or the policies that will dictate what we patients should have when it comes to our treatments or cure, but I'm happy to hear this new concept that uh, it's more on co-partnering with the patients in decision-making. And that is something that... Uh, resonates with our hearts. So thank you for that. So for some questions, maybe we could start with, uh, since most of your discussion focuses on data. So um, as patient organizations, uh, in, in, how can we contribute in the data gathering 
or if you can suggest anything that we can do uh, uh, or suggest that we can partner or, or how to gather this data that is needed for the HTA and for the value-based healthcare. Okay, so I think um, patient can start by identify the same group of patients and form the group first. Uh, that that the easiest way is to form groups. When when you form a group, you s tend to speak louder because one voice combined with multiple voices create a more impact. And 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 when you voice to the government, they, they listen. And we, we need that strong uh, network of patients um, to, first of all, after they identify themselves, they have to think what's the purpose, what's the goal of this kind of network. If they would like to contribute in HTA, I would strongly like recommend them to systemically think of a way to collect data it could be like, uh, for example, your, percep your perception to medication, your day-to-day -day life, your quality of life, your, uh, how you accept new medication and stuff like that. Um, and, and work with HTA agency or research agency like us uh, because they probably don't know where to start. We as uh, HTA agency or, or the government bodies will help them to form those uh, structures and, and guide them on where to start by collecting data, how can you engage in clinical trials, how can you um, give a chair feedback on some certain survey, and, and that would then feed those good qualities of evidence to the research project or research studies, and, and that would then be um, circulate within the cycle of HTA process where the policymakers are looking at this evidence. You've got lots of time if you look on papers, on databases, um, on, on one particular drug like rare diseases or high cost drug, usually it's available elsewhere in high middle income countries. Where, but we don't have that uh, evidence locally available. With that, we need patients to engage with healthcare professionals, with research communities to generate those evidence. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Thomas? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the change in relationship that we need um, where it is an equal relationship between the healthcare professional and the person uh, receiving care and, an ex and, a, 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 and a, a realization from the patient but also from the clinical people that this data, the patient reported data, the goal data, the preference data is very important uh, and that I think needs communication you know, from a patient perspective and the patient advocacy groups I think it's really important that they work with hospitals uh, and healthcare systems to help communicate why we're doing this uh, and why it's important for them. And then it's very important as, as patient advocacy organizations and hospitals that when the data is collected, it is used and that patients see it being used and how it's used and, and that it's used to help shape care and to make decisions. Because when that's done, then people want to engage because they see it's useful. Whereas if it's not used or if it's just a tick box exercise, then of course everybody disengages. So I think patient advocacy groups, groups of patients, hospitals, specialty societies have to work together to communicate to patients and professionals why we're doing it, to support them to make sure the data is properly used. And I think extremely importantly, which we've heard today already, I, I do think that helping people with health literacy is also central to this because if people are literate about the condition they have that of course is a big help with setting goals setting preferences and 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 and, and engaging equally but if people don't want to do that that's also of course fine but at least people are given the option if they wish uh, to um, uh, increase their levels of health literacy all right, thank you for that. 
um, it's really important for us patients to be educated and be aware of these medications, even if our conditions, so that we would be able to choose uh, the right treatment based on the goals that we want, based on the preferences that we want. And another challenge when it comes to HTA is that when it comes to the new medications, like genomic medicines, biologics, biosimilars, and most of us, most of the countries in the Asia Pacific is having a hard time accessing these medications. So in your own opinion, um, what can you suggest that might help uh, fast track the approval of these medications? Yeah, I think it's also resonant what we have mentioned a lot of time before that uh, with particular drug groups like high cost drug for rare diseases, um, that, that obviously is really expensive for patients to access, especially in low middle income countries. Um, but what they can do is that they can work with the doctors, work with healthcare professionals. At the same time, once they form the body, they'll be able to communicate and with the pharmaceutical companies, uh, identify what the available options are the, of the medication out there. And then through the process of HTA, uh, we have what we call a price negotiation, where sometimes the vendor drug is too expensive and it's not as proven to be um, uh, is not cost effective in the setting of Thailand or other countries. Um, we have this system to be able to communicate with the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, this is the scale of the patient within the countries. Um, we realize how important it is to be to, to have this medication available for patient to access uh, in the reimbursement schemes. And what can you do to help us? And then this lead to other channels like patient. Uh, manage the agreements or other ways to be able to make the uh, medication available uh, within the price that okay for the government to pay uh, can afford. At the same time, the pharmaceutical company are willing to 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 do as well. And and with that, the benefits is for the patients. So patients have access to. So for that, I think it start from having uh, engagement in this process by the patients. And, and if you know that you know there's new promising drugs, then talk to your doctors. You know, I, I heard of this one drugs that's really work for the, for my disease in other country, uh, but it's really expensive here. How can we have that in our reimbursement list and stuff like that? So communicate, start from that. After that, you communicate within your group, your uh, patient group, and then with that, you know, it, it have to start from someone, and. And through the process that we have, it, it should lead to uh, the successful stories. Yeah. Thank you. Any inputs? Uh. So I, I, I think it, the, the trouble with our healthcare systems is that they are focused on volume of delivery. Um, and so reimbursement tends to follow volume. And volume is defined across a population. So everybody is treated the same, by and large, uh, irrespective of what you want as a person. Uh, and ir I'm, I'm generalizing here. Of course, it's not always like this, but this is often the case. Irrespective of what you want as a person and irrespective of your own context, where you're from and what, what you and your culture is uh, in, in your community. You take the center of London and University College Hospital in London right in the center. There's, and the, within that tiny little area, all served by that one hospital, it is enormously diverse in terms of cultures, uh, 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 socioeconomic groups, ethnic groups, but everybody is treated in the same way. So what I think is part of the answer to this is a focus on value and a focus on the individual. And there is a, an awful lot of high quality research that shows when you engage in what we're all discussing, shared decision making and focusing on the individual, generally people want less, not more. Uh, and generally you see costs significantly decline. Um, and and, and you know, there's a lot of published literature on that. 
So I think by going in this direction, it is a route to not only helping to achieve what we as individuals want to achieve, it's also a route to better allocating limited resources, which should mean that other opportunities arise, funding medicines and funding other, other things. But I also think it's important that communication is managed because some of these expensive medicines become politically important uh, because large numbers of people believe that they will be helpful for them, when in fact they won't. And Herceptin for breast cancer a number of years ago is a very good example of that. There was a lot of fanfare. It was useful for a small group of people with breast cancer, but there was a wider population belief that it was important for most people with breast cancer. It became a political issue and it was funded. This is in parts of, parts of Europe. So we must be clear when there are expensive medicines, where they can be used, and they must be used according to people's goals and preferences, um, and not just blindly applied to uh, larger groups of uh, people. All right, thank you. And we have a question from our audience. Th th thank you. Um, my name is Canon Subramaniam. I'm from New Zealand. Um, very, very interesting talk, Dr. Thomas. Uh, uh, this is, um, it, what springs to mind is my eight-year-old's question when he gets into a car, are we there yet? And uh, I don't know how long it will us, take us to get there. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll indulge me in a, in a couple of anecdotes from myself. Uh, as a 35-year-old uh, traveling in Paris, I was overcome with significant chest pain. And, um, you know, um, went to a hospital in Paris. And I must say, they did textbook medicine. They threw the book at me, so to speak. I left the hospital with significant chest pain. So uh, they did assure me that I did not have a heart attack. I did not have... Uh, um, you know, any sort of uh, gastroesophageal reflux. I didn't have any broken bones, but I had pain when I left, and the pain didn't go away for another week. Uh, I was not reassured, so the patient centricity there was um, zero, if you ask me, right? Although they had some of the best medical services that I'd ever seen. So that's one. Um, the, the second thing is, you, you touched upon this in the last comment that you made about resources. Um, in New Zealand, we're paying for two frigates for our Navy. Um, I don't know why we buy frigates for the Navy in New Zealand. Um, we, we need medicines for some of our folks. Uh, those two frigates would have paid for a significant number of people, even if they are commoditized. And, and the third point is um, medicines themselves. Um, I am a psychiatrist by trade, and. Uh, Antipsychotics are the worst medicines next to oncology medicines. Um, the, the side effects and, and what the patient feels are just simply horrible. However, um, you know, they're, they're seen to be efficacious in a certain group of people, not everyone, as you said, um, and therefore they are dished out to everybody with, with that condition, a psychotic illness. Um, if you want to make personalized medicine that does not have those side effects and, and those uh, particularly for, for each person, it's going to cost us an arm and a leg, isn't it? And uh, how, how do we reconcile that? You know, how does a community reconcile that? That's the question. Sorry, there were just three anecdotes that... <laughs> no, I thank, thank you very much. And I... Um, I, just on that uh, last bit, it's going to cost an arm and a leg. I, I honestly don't think it is. And if, if we develop a strategy for our organizations, whether it's a patient advocacy group, whether it's a government agency, whether it's a hospital, whether it's you know, my organization, um, we don't go into that organization and say, right, this is what we're going to do. These are our objectives. These are our activities for the next year. Uh, this is who's going to do. We need this organizational structure. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. We don't do that because we know that that leads to disengagement and we know that, that you, you need to engage and you need to produce this strategy together. And I think it is exactly the same with healthcare. The idea uh, of, of being able to just tell people, 
this is what you've got, this is what we're going to do, get on with it, and that's it. Uh, you know, that is, I'm being a little bit, uh, I, I'm exaggerating a bit, but that, there's a, that, that is partly what we, what we do. And that, I think, disengages, it doesn't maximally engage and empower. And that is expensive, because we know with people who don't comply or with people that don't, are not optimally treated, that leads to such a whole host of problems uh, in terms of eco lost economic output, if they're carers, problems with their children, I mean, caring costs for them as adults, you know, the, the whole host of things becomes expensive. And that's the first thing I would say, that we have to see this not as a cost, but as an investment, because of the much wider societal impacts that spending on healthcare has. Um, Number one. Number two, I just go back to what I said a little bit earlier, which is that, and I, I'll give a little bit more detail to this example. So you can Google this in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, um, an article looking at hip and knee osteoarthritis. And when they engaged in shared decision making, focusing on what those people wanted, both in terms of the level of function in their hip or knee with their arthritis, and in terms of their preference, what they wanted for management, it showed a 38% reduction in operative intervention. So a 38% reduction in surgery, uh, and they went for other forms of care, physiotherapy, uh, gentle exercise, this sort of thing. And over 10 years, it, it saved uh, 9 billion US dollars. Um, and that, again, it's, it's one example, but it's an example in a very highly respected medical journal with quite a rigorous study showing that personalized care does not have to be expensive, and in fact, it can be the opposite. When done well and properly, it can, it can save money. That's Thank you for your input. And, uh uh, th thank you very much. Um, um, again, I think I'll, for both speakers, uh, as you know, we started this um, conference by coming to the point that we would like to see uh, predictive, preventative, participatory, personalized, and preemptive healthcare. And I think this is what we must remember that in the generation before us, health technology and uh, science was advancing slowly. Nowadays, knowledge is doubling every 30 days, as we say, somebody's saying. So for us to prepare for this new onslaught of uh, health technologies that are coming at us thick and fast, especially after the genomic medicine got its approval through the COVID, you know, uh, what, what is your reckoning on this? Should we be now developing some kind of agile STA or an agile value-based uh, uh, system? You know, because we have to match everybody else. If uh, if the cheetah gets faster, then the gazelle has to learn how to dodge quicker. Uh, do we need to now do that? Because uh, citizen power is rising. So, what are you thinking on those? Because it's um, it's there. Yeah, maybe I cannot really hear it clearly, but from, so now, yes, we have the Asia share link where, uh, correct me if I did not answer your question, I, I couldn't hear properly, but we have the Asia share link. It's a network of Asia, uh, HTA agency within Asia and also broader uh, within the world as well, like including some country from Africa and Europe. Um, so with that, I think patient engagement and patient society also need the same, uh, you know, with, with this Asia-Pacific uh, Patient Congress. Uh, we need the same where we have to collaborate and work closely together how the HCA agency can closely work together with the age with, with the patient society or patient groups um, starting from having uh, drafting up the network the guideline framework how do we put patient within those process of HTA uh, the frameworks and everything like right from the start and but the, the only problem here I think especially in Asia is that 
uh, we we they're still limited of the awareness and and, and generally speaking the the technical education or capacities uh, for for those patients who, who really strong uh, strongly believe and really determined to be part of this uh, engagement but they, they're not ready yet and they don't fully understand so with that reach out to uh, your um, nearby HD agency in, in, in some in, in every countries um, we, we have this certain or, or similar organization and you know attend some trainings or webinars and by listening to it, I'm, I'm pretty sure our patients, uh, a representative for in this group, uh, now realize that you can voice, you know, your yourself, and, and you can actually be participate within the HTA process, and 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 that's important. Just by raising awareness is already a, a good step to, to start with, and. To create that strong system within Asia Pacific, uh, we, we need that strong collaboration and, and the government structure as well and the funding because <laughs> uh, because patients, you know, they have to go to hospital at the same time, they have to learn themselves all of this technical term, they have to attend this meeting. And and, and with, with that, I, I think we are starting to, to, to see those activities forming in Asia Pacific. At the same time, it, it doesn't happen in one day. It, it needs that strong kind of sustainable structure to be able to uh, help them, guide them through the way. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure whether I answer your question or not. I can't really hear, sorry. Yeah. All right, are there any more questions from our audience here or online all right so i think one of my takeaways here is that communication is number one key and uh i i guess with the with your ministry uh for patients uh for them if you want to learn about hda i think their agencies or their ministries are more than uh, able to help you understand these technologies or these terminologies in HDA and value-based healthcare. And, and another thing that I got from our conversation is that collaboration is very important. As patient organizations, we need to establish good relationship and partnership with uh, medical societies, hospitals, universities, and other research institutes. So, Maybe before we end this session, uh, do you have any last words to our audience? Um, maybe just for information, um, if you would like to learn about HTA, uh, you can simply Google um, HTA in Thailand or HITAP. It should come up. We have a lots of uh, easy to understand materials there. And, and let's, it, actually next week, uh, just by your question, we are actually having a Asia Share Link 2022 conference in Pattaya. Uh, it's it's one of the biggest conference to gather um, young or junior researcher in HTA to, to try to build the capacity. Uh, although it's really technical oriented, but you are also welcome to join and just listen in how what's the process of HTA uh, and what's the technical. Uh, 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 you know, process that we use to, to generate good evidence. So yeah, that's for information. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, okay.